I'm Manas Sharma, a PhD student at the University of Vienna, and I'd like to welcome you to my talk, Density Functional Embedding Theory for Excited States. So I'm developing and implementing Density Functional Embedding Theory within the TurboMole program package that employs Gaussian basis functions, and the implementation is coupled with correlated wave function theory methods like molar placid or coupled cluster methods like CCSDT. Furthermore, it is also coupled with real-time time-dependent density functional theory or RTTD DFT. So what is this DFET or density function embedding theory? Well, in a nutshell, it allows us to treat a small portion of our system using a higher level of theory that is computationally very expensive but more accurate, while the remaining not so important part of a system can be treated using a lower level of theory that is not so computationally demanding. Therefore, the FED finds its applications in hybrid systems such as solvated molecules or a molecule adsorbed on a surface. In such systems, the focus of our study or the region of interest is usually just the small molecule or maybe a few atoms around it. The periodic slab, which is usually the environment in such cases, can be usually well described using LDA or GGADFT. However, the cluster or the molecule requires a high level treatment using either hybrid functional DFT or wave function theory methods like CCSDT. If you decide to treat the entire system using LDA or GGADFT, then you might sometimes get large errors in local properties like adsorption energies or excitation energies. On the other hand, if you try to treat the entire system using something like CCSDT, then of course it is not um, computationally um, very uh, feasible and also not usually needed. Furthermore, you also get um, periodic, um, you also get unrealistic surface coverages when you employ periodic boundary conditions, and one usually has to resolve to a really large supercell to address this issue. The solution to all these problems comes quite naturally within the framework of density functional theory, where you can partition the density of the total hybrid system into a cluster and an environment density. The influence of the environment onto the cluster can be taken in the form of an embedding potential, which is a function of both the cluster and environment density. And various strategies to construct this embedding potential have been implemented, so we'll have a look at those now. I will consider the benzene molecule as the environment and the water molecule as the cluster or the region of interest. So in the method one, what we do is we relax the isolated environment density, and then we plug that density into the formula of the embedding potential, and then we relax the embedding potential in the presence of this I'm sorry, relax the cluster density in the presence of this embedding potential. This method is actually approximated in nature because if you have a look at the embedding potential, then you see the usual terms like the potential due to the nuclei of the environment, that is the first term, then the potential due to the electrons of the environment, that is the second term, then the third and the fourth terms are for the exchange, non-additive exchange correlation potential. And this final term is the problem that is the non-additive kinetic energy potential. And one has to resolve to approximate kinetic energy density functionals to calculate that. And just like the exchange correlation functionals, we do not really know the exact form of this functional. In the method two, we relax the density of the total system using some lower level method like LD or GGDFT. And then we subtract the isolated cluster density from this total density and use this remainder density as an approximation for the environment density. And then we again plug this back into the embedding potential and then relax the cluster density in the presence of this embedding potential. Just like method one, this is also approximate in nature due to the presence of kinetic energy density functionals. The method three is basically the same as the method one. However, here the need for the approximate kinetic energy density functionals is circumvented by employing projection operators that orthogonalize the orbitals of subsystem uh, uh, of the cluster and the environment with respect to each other. So this is the projection operator. And thereafter, a freeze and thaw procedure may be performed where the roles of the environment and the cluster are interchanged iteratively until the densities are converged. To sum up, I will say that the method one and method two are suitable for treating weakly interacting systems, while the method three is suitable for treating um, strongly interacting or even systems with um, covalent bonds. So enough about the theory now, let's have a look at the kind of results you can expect in practice. So before I move on to the excited state properties, let me just briefly show you some ground state results obtained with molecule in molecule DFET. So here are some binding energies. So please bear in mind that here you cannot do anything better than DFT. So these just serve as a benchmark. So the results can only get as good as regular DFT. 
So for weekly interacting systems like H2 dimer or HF dimer, we see that method one with or without Friesenthal performs reasonably well. However, for strongly interacting systems such as the ethane molecule partition at the carbon-carbon covalent bond, there is a um, really huge error and it performs miserably. The method three as expected gives exact results as the regular DFT. However, the caveat is that one requires a supermolecular basis to do so. Then I will show you a ground state result employing molecule in periodic DFT, which is coupled with wave function theory method CCSCT. So here I have plotted the adsorption energies of the hydrogen molecule on top of an H10 1D periodic chain at various separation distances using LDA DFT as well as CCSCT. And of course, LDA DFT over um, binds the molecule onto the chain as well as predicts a too short equilibrium distance. Therefore, it is an un insufficient to describe such interactions. Now let's consider the H2 molecule as well as the two atoms below it as our cluster or the region of interest and employ the method two that I discussed earlier to construct the embedding potential and then just plug that embedding potential into the Hartree-Fock Hamiltonian and then get the reference Hartree-Fock orbitals for the usual CCLCT calculation. And we can see that the CCSDT DFET results in the green color are now much closer to the CCSDT results. And we get these results at just a fraction of computational cost uh, of the regular uh, CCSDT on the whole system because we are only using the basis functions that are centered on top of the active region or the cluster. Finally, we come to the excited state properties. So here I will show you results obtained with CC2 coupled with DFET as well as RTTD DFT coupled with DFET. For CC2 in DFT, we use solvated molecules like acetone, methylene cyclopropene, or acrolein in water. And here in the green column, you see the first excitation energy of the total system obtained using CC2. And in the remaining columns, you see the errors associated with the different methods. So here we see that method one gives just a maximum error of 0.03 electron volts, which is quite nice. Method 1 with freeze and thaw, however, somewhat gives a larger error, therefore there was some beneficial error cancellation going on earlier. The method 2, as expected, performs uh, the worst with a large error of 0.62 electron volt. And I say as expected because um, the way the embedding potential was constructed was quite um, simplistic and we also violated some underlying principles to do so. For the adenine thymine base pair, again, we will have a look at the CC2 excitation energies of the total system in the green column and then the errors associated with the different methods in the remaining columns. And here we have the first six excitation energies. And again, DFET with method one performs really good. We just get a maximum error of 0.05 electron volt. And with method one with freeze and thaw again, we get similar results. And this time method two does not give as large errors as before. So method two sometimes works, sometimes does not. Finally, coming to RTTD DFT coupled with DFET. So here what I do is I basically propagate the density of the cluster in time in the presence of the embedding potential. And as you might remember, this embedding potential is also a function of the cluster density as well as the environment density. So what I do is I keep the environment density frozen to the ground state density while the cluster density is still evolved in time. Therefore, you can imagine that such a method will work usually for the cases where the electron the excitations or the environment doesn't respond to the excitations of the cluster. Therefore, I will consider two representative cases of LIH where the excitations of the H negative and the Li positive are uncoupled and then a benzene fulvene dimer where the excitations are of course coupled. So here we see the isolated spectra of the H negative and Li positive ions and then the regular RTTD DFT spectra in green color. And you can see that, of course, um, we cannot reproduce it by just superimposing the isolated spectra together. Therefore, now we employ method one to construct the embedding potential and perform RTTD DFT. And we see somewhat reasonable agreement with the reference results, although not very good in the starting, but it works reasonably well considering we are just using a monomolecular basis. Then we employ method two, and this time the spectra is basic. The spectrum is basically the same as before, but just slightly red shifted. So even though method two was construct, uh, constructed in such a simplistic manner, it still captures the uh, qualitative um, features of the peaks quite well. Next, um, I employ method one with a supermolecular basis. That is, the basis functions will be centered on all the atoms of the system, and this time the agreement is slightly much better. 
and then with method three and a monomolecular basis we see very bad results and this is to be expected as i said before that method three requires a supermolecular basis to work however the method three with the projection operator and a supermolecular basis is able to reproduce the exact rtdd dft spectrum and this is because of course as i said before in this case the excitations are uncoupled therefore it doesn't matter even if the environment density is kept frozen in time Finally, um, with the benzene fulvene dimer, here is the result with, uh, or the comparison of the method one with the regular RTDD DFT. There are some qualitative agreements, however, the peaks are quite overestimated in intensities. And then the method three, and this time the agreement is much better. So that brings me to my conclusion, that is DFET using Gaussian basis functions is quite useful to study hybrid systems and molecule in molecule and molecule in periodic DFET has been implemented using quite efficient techniques. And DFET coupled with wave function theory methods offers a reasonably improved description of ground and excited state properties. And also the coupling with RTTD DFT seems to work out quite well. So now my task right now is to basically implement the molecule in periodic embedding using the projection operator. And th that is what I'm doing right now and this will help us to perform RTTDDFT for a molecule in a periodic system. Nonetheless, um, even, even if, if we are using a supermolecular basis, it's still nice because um, we cannot really do RTTDDFT for a periodic system in turbo mode right now. And also I would like to couple the DFET code with the high harmonic generation simulations. So recently also I tried to collaborate with an experimental group where um, they were simulating the harmonic generation spectra for the uh, tetraphenyl porphyrin molecules and uh, the uh, zinc porphyrin. However, um, the problem was that our code uses localized basis functions and we were worried that, of course, uh, our results won't match very well. But it seems that uh, comparing with octopus and um, the experimental results, at least for the um, peaks that are below the ionization potential, the agreement was still um, there. So, uh, I mean, uh, so therefore I want to couple it with DFET and also implement some complex absorbing potentials and see what I can get there. And then also we need to find ways to circumvent the use of a supermolecular basis, which is also something I'm working on right now and also implement something like hyperpolarizabilities and whatnot. So, yeah, so finally, I would like to thank my supervisor, Professor Marek Sierka, for his continued guidance and support throughout NOA project for the funding and my salary, TurboMole for the development support, and ETSF for giving me an opportunity to present my work at this workshop. And finally, thank you for your attention, and I would be happy to address any questions that you might have.